Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, welcome to another week of This Jungian Life. And before we get started with our topic, I'd like to take just a minute to let listeners know about the Philadelphia Jung Seminar, which will begin again this coming September. And the seminar meets eight weekends a year. Each session is taught by a different Jungian analyst, including sometimes me, Deb, and Joseph. And the seminar is right for those who have a serious interest in Jung and have had some Jungian analysis. You don't need to be a clinician, although the seminar is the first step in applying for Jungian training. So if you'd like to know more, you can visit our website at cgjungphiladelphia.org, and we'll also put that link in the show notes. So transitioning now to our topic, several readers have written in and want to know from a Jungian perspective, what's going on with burnout? And it's a a term that shows up on talk shows, articles are written about it, and people are are noticing that they have a lack of control in their jobs, that they have unclear job expectations, their jobs feel dysfunctional, they're working an outrageous amount of hours, and they're feeling really awful. And, and this is not unique to the United States. Uh, in Japan, there's a terrible um, problem where young male executives are working 10, 15 hours a day, sometimes without a day off for extended periods, and they're dying of heart attacks and strokes You know, on the trains uh, to their homes. So um, a lot of clinicians are writing about this, perhaps from a neurologic standpoint or from a health maintenance standpoint. But we're interested in what what the Jungian perspective might be to help us understand it. I am aware that uh, the WHO recently uh, formally recognized burnout as a syndrome. And, you know, it has measurable consequences in terms of its economic impact. It does. People are missing work. People are underperforming at work, allegedly. It's influencing their other areas of life. I mean, if people are incredibly stressed, fatigued, they're sad, irritable, they have insomnia, I mean, all that stuff that people get, you know, how present can they be to their children? How present can they be to their spouses and and their social groups? So it has this kind of pernicious, almost infective effect on a lot of different areas. I'm thinking about uh, what a strong protest psyche can start up uh, in a person who is suffering from what we call burnout and that something in the psyche is saying, I can't stand this. I can't stand it. I hate this. Um, I don't feel alive, just stressed and pressured. I often liken it to driving a car with the emergency brake on. You, you can do it, uh, but the car won't run very well. And eventually the car will burn out and that it's a call to pay attention to something big going on, not just perhaps with this particular job or that particular boss, but with my life, with my values. And what myth, and what God am I serving? What mythology is kind of percolating under the surface? I mean, certainly having someone uh, come into our office with burnout is something I'm sure that we've all experienced. I mean, I know I certainly have. And the way that we would tend to look at it is where is uh, perhaps the person's work life not in alignment with a deeper calling or a deeper set of values with something that need, that's coming from what we would call the self with a capital S. And the presence of the self at the center of our psychological life, whether or not we know this consciously, demands a balance of factors 
in the human soul, in the human psyche. And one of the primary balancing demands is that the conscious life and the unconscious life, that the rational and the irrational are both valued and tended to. And as Deb was saying earlier, when we're overvaluing the ego life, the waking life, that the unconscious begins to stage an insurrection. It begins to secretly, you know, depress the parking brake or, you know, flip us into first gear, although we're trying to drive 60 miles an hour, as a signal uh, for us to focus on, on the unconscious, to focus on the dream life, the fantasy life, the life of the body, and our relationship to nature, for that matter. Yes, our, our own nature and and nature, nature. Um, I think also in that sense, we could say that burnout could be possibly associated with a call toward individuation, that it is a message from the unconscious that something is out of balance, as you were, both were alluding to. And therefore, the kind of uh, parking brake effect, it is an attempt to rebalance the psyche. It's an attempt to stop us because we're going down the wrong road. And I like what you said, Lisa. Paradoxically, it can be a call to individuation, a call to come home to ourselves and pay attention to what's going on in the psyche and perhaps even spend some time outdoors sitting under a tree or at the beach or whatever basic millennium old roots we have stop. Let's see what comes up from the unconscious. You know, I once worked with someone, and I've experienced this myself too, who was really tutored by her parents very strongly to uh, pick a profession that would pay well, that would be secure. Uh, We were both in teaching, and she had a particular specialty. She started to experience some real resistance and so on. And then she began painting in her garage. (laughs) She got some lights so that she could light up what she was working on. This engendered eventually a whole career shift into something that she loved and was called to versus the shoulds. Uh, You should get a graduate degree and you should get a graduate degree in something that would lead to a job where you should save money and live for the future in this false hope of security versus living in the present. And that's what was happening of living into the future, which was at that point 40 years away and no life in the here and now. And living in the, into the future in that regard is compensating for the current troubles by living in a fantasy world that there's a fantasy of the future that will be better, different. And that installation of hope or being transported imaginally out of the circumstance, you know, is, is a coping mechanism and it might work for a certain amount of time. But then again, the body and the unconscious rarely finds that refreshing enough to carry us the distance. So there's a mythology uh, underlying all this, which is that security can be attained and that it can be attained by having a secure profession and earning enough money. It's also tied to the American myth of sort of the heroic uh, lone wolf, the cowboy, the industrial magnate, all of that sort of heroic uh, kind of mythology that America has. You know, I think, Deb, that you're lifting up one classic way that burnout can surface where someone has kind of um, harnessed themselves to the yoke of maybe a conventional profession that offers some security, but they're being called to something perhaps a little unconventional. But my own story of burnout was a little different than that. I, in my 20s, I worked for uh, a nonprofit uh, refugee organization, and I was actually working in Bosnia in the 1990s. And so this was work that initially I felt, you know, so called to do, and it felt deeply meaningful. 
I was there for two years. And toward the end, I, I got profoundly burnt out. I mean, just profoundly burnt out. And, and I think um, some of it was the fact that as an expatriate working for an intense kind of refugee assistance program in the midst of a war, the hours were long. There were all kinds of challenges, some that you could probably predict and others that would might surprise you. But I also think that it was related to a loss of a sense of meaning. And I think that burnout is often associated with a sense of cynicism or when, when we're doing something that doesn't feel meaningful. It's not that I, do, that I don't think that the work that the nonprofit was doing was good work, but ultimately I could see that delivering you know, seed packs for backyard gardens, which is one of the programs that we ran, which was a great program sort of addressed food insecurity in, in war-torn Bosnia in this really creative way. But it didn't stop people from being massacred. <laughs> the massacre at Karajda happened when I was there. And um, the men, uh, the young and the teen boys were all killed. And the women and the small children were sent packing. And we gave the women and children soap and toothpaste. We were able to receive them and help find them places to stay and soap and toothpaste matter. But it, it for me, it, I, I was getting really cynical. Yeah, it felt like a hollow response. Yes. But yet all that could be done for any one person in that moment. Yeah. Right. And, and it didn't seem to be addressing the deeper things that were going on, both in terms of, you know, the practical external human rights situation, but even the dynamics underlying these kinds of interactions, which was something that I was feeling deeply drawn to. The meaning moved elsewhere for me. It's like the sense of meaning migrated. The search for meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can certainly hear that, that uh, giving uh, seed packets, however helpful it is, or toothpaste and temporary shelter doesn't solve the problem, and it undermines a sense of effectiveness. And I think we all want to feel effective and that that has inherent meaning of I did this, 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 and this, and then the outcome made a difference. Yeah. And I, my guess would be that feeling ineffective at work would have that would highly correlate with feeling burnt out. I know in businesses that people can burn out when the expectation, the demands, the responsibilities are not matched by a sufficient sense of authority or access to resources. So yes, you're expected to you know, basically accomplish a minor miracle and you have just a few, you know, a screwdriver and maybe a, a jackknife and a pen and pencil to do it with. So it's like responsibility without authority and resources. Yeah. And that, that, that goes so deep in the human psyche because we want it most of the time, to do the job and to be effective. And the mismatch between responsibility and authority is tough. So when I'm sitting with that, Deb, I'm returning to this the sense of helplessness, which, which, which is also what I think uh, Lisa was talking about, that something's being asked and there just doesn't seem to be any path to satisfy what's being required. We see this also, you know, you're working in a corporation, you're, you know, two of your colleagues' jobs, you know, have been evaporated and all of those duties roll up to you. So really you're doing the work of three people and it's part of this kind of corporate model that a human resource can be infinitely stressed because it will miraculously become infinitely innovative, which is really just another fiction, a, a fantasy. And it also, to me, points up a lack of empathy. Yes. A, a lack of humanity of that. Well, then, you know, you could just do the job of these other two people as well as your own job. Get up earlier, stay up later, work more efficiently. Yeah. And then we're back in this real kind of one-sided place, right, where the demands of the job are so much that we only have time and capacity to address egoic life, as you were talking about before, Joseph, there's there's kind of complete one-sidedness and there's no time for the underground, to drink from the underground spring that could renew us. 
And one of the things that I'll often be counseling someone in that situation is reminding them that they have the capacity to say no. That in many of these systems, people lose the capacity to say no, and they also forget that sometimes a work system has to fail and provide that feedback to the corporate leaders so that they actually could believe that the model that they're using is is not sufficient. But I think that people connect to their work environment very similarly to the way that they experience their families in childhood. And where a child has an enormous imperative to make sure that the family succeeds because there's this instinct about one's own survival. And so that gets applied to a corporate model. And that even though you might be tasked with the work of three extra people, the thought of allowing the system to fail, not nefariously, but because that's inevitable, seems incredibly anxiety provoking. And and people will often even go to a panic. Yeah, the need to transfer that early parental attachment and survival to the corporation who becomes the super parent. Yeah. And I mean, I, I do think that there's some reality to that fear, though, because there are some work environments like, well, if you won't do it, you know, we'll find someone who will. So there is there is some reality basis for just wanting to say yes, yes, yes. Which is also generational. The The incredible, miraculous thing that I'm noticing with millennials is that they will just leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they're working there for 24 months and someone expects you to take on the work of three other people. They'll just put in a resignation and have enough confidence in themselves and in the environment to know that they can transition into another opportunity. And baby boomers like me, that never occurred to us that we could be that nimble, that agile. But I think what we're seeing in the younger generations is that they are much less frequently projecting the family complex and the parental complex onto their jobs. They're really seeing jobs as tools to get them to a lifestyle or tools that allow them to actualize, which is much more realistic. Yeah, there can be this kind of misplaced loyalty to the employer. And I've certainly seen it, you know, where someone works for decades at a given place and it's really kind of their life. And maybe they've really sacrificed a lot in terms of their personal life to work at some place. And then the day comes and they're just, you know, pack up, get yourself, go home. There's not even a goodbye party, you know? Right. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. And, and driving high paid workers out of the environment so that they can bring somebody young and new who's willing to work for less in the environment. So I understand the anxiety that people have if they're not thinking ahead, if they're not seeing themselves as nimble. Yeah. Instead of this uh, older myth of actualization through work, uh, the millennials say, no, wait a minute. Uh, There are many other dimensions to life and um, they're less willing to sacrifice those. Absolutely. They feel that they are connected to something larger. There's also the whole archetype of work itself, which is at the foundation of the founding of America, that the whole Puritan Protestant work ethic that, um, that one should, in fact, work very hard all the time, that one should be incredibly disciplined, one should be incredibly frugal, and that uh, God himself is, is asking or demanding that of humanity. And then that wonderful idea that the devil finds work for idle hands, that in, in these older generations, that it was nefarious or even dangerous to not be constantly laboring. And, and I think that's still woven into people's overworking feelings. And also the sense of belief that the world will offer other opportunities and that the person himself or herself uh, has an inner well that is generative and from which he or she can draw sustenance uh, versus a belief of if I, if I lose this job, it's all over for me. 
Yeah. And I just want to offer the compensatory view that it is noble and often adaptive to work really, really hard. I'm thinking of um, James Hollis has this wonderful book, Mythologems, and in it he says, the hero task is apparent in the humblest of lives, especially in those who rise wearily and go off to demeaning labor to support their families. And Jung actually says somewhere, he talks about the man who gets up every day and, and goes to some menial job as an everyday hero. So those Japanese businessmen dropping dead on the train, you know, there is, I mean, it's, it's, it's it's all a question of balance, isn't it? Because that kind of heroic uh, attitude of, of I'm going to do whatever it takes to make enough money to support my family or to pay my bills there, there is a place for that. And I'm curious when we think back to our parents and grandparents generations, was there any other way that burnout was languaged? I mean, burnout is kind of a a modern colloquial expression, but how were our parents or grandparents talking about it just being too much for them? And I have to say that I don't know that I ever heard that kind of language, or maybe it was just happening behind closed doors, but as kids, uh, you know, I don't know that I heard that complaint. Right. there's, There's maybe too much stoicism in previous generations you know, that that you just did it and it didn't matter if it was all dried up for you. Right. And the Stoic philosophy might have allowed them to, as you said, heroically embrace what is required. Well, to, as Deb, I think, was saying, to find it meaningful to do it. And I think a lot of people, and perhaps men in particular, do find great meaning in being the provider. You're taking care of your family and that's meaningful. I'm just taking a dog leg turn um, over to the left, I think, uh, because a fairy tale has been percolating in my head. (laughs) And uh, I think we all think that uh, as Jungians, that fairy tales and myths are basically our psychic skeletons and all our rest of our psychic ligaments and tendons and so on have to be supported by bone. And the fairy tale I have in mind is Rumpelstiltskin where we have the parental archetype of our heroine's father announces to the king that his daughter uh, is able to turn straw into gold. The king says, hey, great, terrific, bring her on in, and puts her in a room with lots of hay and locks the door and basically says, "You, you better have this turned into gold by morning. And that the person that helps her accomplish this mission impossible task is our demanding Uh, evil little man who says, yes, you know, uh, I'll help you, but in return for, you know, her jewelry and then finally her firstborn child. And how much of that gets lived out uh, in a somewhat, if I may use the word, brutal at times corporate culture, your situation in Bosnia, Lisa, or people leave and one person gets to do the job of two other people, and the lack of compassion and the lack of heart and this poor heroine who has to be in service to a very harsh parental demand, both from her father and then from the king. Yeah, that that's a really great example because it, it shows, I mean, I've always felt like that, that story is in part about a kind of father wound because it's really the father's narcissism that places her in that situation. And for some people, that can be what launches them into uh, a, a, a work situation where they're being asked to do impossible things that they don't really have the resources for, but they're they're trying to meet that inner parental demand, that sort of internalized father voice that says, you know, you need to spin straw into gold, even though that's impossible. I wonder too if this is pointing to a, a call for more feminine values. And I know this terminology can be a little sort of confusing, but just as functions of the psyche, those values we tend to call feminine of empathy, compassion, receptivity, connectedness, community, nurturing of those kinds of values, which for the sake of verbal efficiency, we tend to call feminine. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a beautiful addition there, Deb. And and in that fairy tale, you know, it is it is the feminine principle that's wounded, right? It's her I mean, she has to give up her firstborn child. The the happy conclusion of that tale comes about because it's her female in the original version of the tale, it's her female servant who discovers Rumpelstiltskin's real name and thereby rescues the baby. So there it is something about the return of the feminine principle. And, you know, if I may, that is also to be seen in another fairy tale that just if I think when you said, you know, how did our ancestors speak of it? I wonder if soul loss would be one way of imagining burnout. And I'm thinking of this fairy tale, this grim tale called The Water of Life. It is a um, beautiful, beautiful tale. And, and I, I want to read just the first sentence or so from it, uh, because I, I think it gets right into what we're talking about. It begins, there once was a king who had an illness, and no one believed that he would come out of it with his life. He had three sons who were much distressed about it and went down into the palace garden and wept. There they met an old man who inquired as to the cause of their grief. They told him that their father was so ill that he would most certainly die, for nothing seemed to cure him. Then the old man said, I know of one more remedy, and that is the water of life. If he drinks of it, he will become well again, but it is hard to find. And the rest of the tale, as you might imagine, is how this wonderful elixir is recovered. And it does involve uh, a relationship with the feminine, which is very obviously lacking in the beginning of the story, right? We've got an old man, we've got the king, and we've got the three sons. So this image, which crops up a lot in myth and and fairy tales and alchemical imagery as well, of the ailing king, that the dominant principle in the psyche is worn out, is spent and exhausted, and needs to be renewed somehow. That brings me back to even the the term burnout, that when a candle is burned out, it's it's just run all the way down to the last bit of wax and the wick is finished and then the flame finally just dies. There's just no more fuel to keep the fire going. And so in the tale of the old king dying, that often represents the dominant stance in life or the guiding attitude with which somebody has made decisions and and established a set of values and independent from whether or not you like your job, the psyche can get sick and tired of having all of our decisions uh, circling around a particular attitude that we may have just inherited from our parents or inherited from our educational system, perhaps aren't aware of or haven't even really verbalized to ourselves before. And that that central value may have very little to do with who you are authentically. And then finally, just whatever juice that came in with just flickers out. And then we're in this kind of crisis, which we call burnout, which is also an opportunity. Yes. And so when someone comes into my office reporting a sense of burnout, I think I'm looking for that opportunity that you mentioned, Joseph. And the question is sort of like, what would bring renewal? Like, where is the water of life? What is that thing? And my assumption is that there's something and that something in that person's psyche has a sense of what it is. And so I would really be listening for what's the new thing that's wanting attention? What is the, what is the value that's been devalued perhaps that is looking to be paid attention to? And sometimes people can get a hint of that by remembering what they loved to do when they were children. Yes, and or and even even what they wanted to be when they were kids. I'll often say, when you were a kid, what did you want to be? I ask people too, what is their favorite fairy tale or myth? And it could show up um, in today's world as a movie or a more recent children's book of some sort or an action figure hero lots of ways that that can manifest of looking for what was that inner thing that grabbed you. So we're, we're really talking about uh, this Jungian concept of the ego self axis, which is this idea that there's a line of communication, hopefully 
between the deep guiding self and the ego. And that sometimes that gets blocked up and we're, we stop being able to kind of hear the guidance that comes to us from the self. And, and how can we revivify that connection? And there ha- needs to be sort of a, like taking a U-turn from the external world stuff of, okay, well, let's think about other careers that might be of interest, uh, other job possibilities in your field, uh, maybe switch from Corporation A to Corporation B or something like that versus the turning inward, of turning inward to find the water of life. And it's often really hard for us trained to be externally oriented and job focused to believe like, yeah, there's going to be a payoff for this. I don't No, 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 no. What I need is a solution to my career issue. And it's going to be external versus internal. And depending on somebody's probably character style, that sometimes people really do need to be translated into a different physical environment. And some people really just need to open the inner doors to the imaginal world. But I'm thinking of a story that a friend of mine told me many years ago. He had worked really assertively to get his master's degree, and he was in a in a career that was very demanding, but he enjoyed And he had this tremendous sense of feeling alienated from himself and that a lot of childhood burdens were kind of zooming around in his head. He decided very bravely that he was going to actually find a little village in South America because he he did speak Spanish and he was going to kind of create an almost subsistence life for himself. So he actually lived in like a little yurt in a small village in uh, South America where he would like have to walk to the market and he swam in the river and he met the kind of local wise woman and he needed to be there for about a year. And I could have talked to him much more about it, but when I asked him, so what was the therapeutic arc of that experience? And he said that it took several months, but finally he was able to differentiate what his own organic responses were to the vicissitudes of life instead of how he should respond or what he should like. And that he was so alienated from how he actually felt or how his body actually responded to things that he was in a state of tremendous pain and tumult. So after this year being in an environment that was very, very simplistic, Um, He was able to come back and then chart a course that was guided by his authentic responses to stimulus. And we live at a great distance now from nature, like the person that you knew. That was his therapeutic modality, so to speak. Swim in the river, walk to the market. We're not that different psychically from people who lived thousands of years ago. As I recently had a chance to really experience in my trip to Crete, of we do need to live close to the living world. And in our high rises and condos and internet connections, we are we're very, very far removed from the roots that have sustained us for thousands and thousands of years. And that world is the world of instinct. And that shows up marvelously in fairy tales where There'll be a hero or a heroine is has a problem or is on a journey. And there might be uh, humans who give them advice or give them bad advice or misdirect them. But when an animal usually shows up in a fairy tale, the animal often speaks very bluntly and, and very clearly. And like the wolf might trot up to you and say, no, I'll eat the horse. Then you jump on my back and then we're going to go five miles down the road and we're going to find the princess. It, you know, it's not convoluted, it's very direct, and it's unambivalent. And if we think about wild animals, you know, they're very unambivalent. You know, there's an instinct, and there's a movement to gratify the instinct. And this neurotic troubling about whether or not the instinct is acceptable or not acceptable, or what people will think about my instinct, and uh, is the time right, and all the other stuff that we do to thwart ourselves can be really, really difficult. Right. And one of the things that I think you're lifting up just to bring it back is that we can get burnt out when we're 
alienated from our own instincts and when we don't know ourselves what matters to us and where our true values lie. Absolutely. And and one of the insidious ways that that surfaces in the culture is that people's actual experiences in a moment are incorrectly attributed to a wrong stimulus. And the whole world of advertising circulates around this. So you're, you're shown an advertisement of maybe an incredibly sexual scenario, and then that's linked to a car. And then the advertisers are basically trying to convince you that that level of arousal is really should land on this new car, that the car will grant you this level of arousal. But also, you know, politicians will create a tremendous level of distress through images and narratives, and then they'll offer a false causality for it. And then people are, you know, running towards a false solution to their distress, which never really resolves it. And that's one of the things that happens when we're divorced from instinct, is that we can't really smell out the way an animal would. What's the source of my distress? Which often is rather a, a fairly straight line that has been obscured. And if we really had a straight line to what is actually distressing me, you know, then we might have the choice of of having a, a an accurate and effective intervention of some kind. What you're pointing to, I think, is that burnout is more than just uh, personal, that there are cultural values and how we are misdirected by things like advertising, advertisements and the new car or the new whatever it is will make you happy, and the political situation in America and around the world. And you can make a list of macro factors that affect us personally uh, and can contribute to burnout. That could be you know, multi-factored. One of the things that also is just very simple and, and yet is so difficult in our culture is that people don't go to sleep when they're tired. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's so true. simple. It's true. But you know, people get home and they're like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. So what I'll do is watch Netflix for f- until two o'clock in the morning. Or I'm exhausted. Oh, I've got to go to sleep. So what I'll, what I need to do is get on that game you know, that I'm playing, you know, internationally with people over the headset all across the world until it's four in the morning and then I'll go to bed. But, you know, so then there is this tremendous divorce from something that is so simple, like your body's tired, you actually are ready to go to sleep. But then some other conversation starts in our minds. So we seek the stimulation of internet or games or whatever it is, rather than the repose and the rest, which is uh, going to sleep, or like uh, the person that you knew, going to South America and living very, very simply for a year of going in the other direction instead of seeking yeah, more goals, more stimulation. I agree with what you're saying, that certain kind of cultural factors can distract us from what we know we actually need. And I'm also aware just in, you know, having worked with people, there are other reasons that are a little more subtle why we, why we might feel cut off from what we want or need. You know, so for example, someone who perhaps has been in a career field for a while that's been very, very meaningful to them, something that they've invested in, they've been to graduate school, they've made all kinds of sacrifices. It's a career experience. It's a career field that perhaps is service oriented even. But then as you near midlife, values sometimes start to mysteriously shift. And it may be that it feels like admitting that to oneself feels like a betrayal of who you used to be. It might feel like a betrayal of your friends who are passionately committed to the same cause that you've been working on. And to say, you know, I I used to really love to do political organizing, but now I just find that it is lifeless. And now I want to, I don't know, become a pastry chef or whatever it is, you know, but that somehow it's it's that mysterious upwelling of new values 
that we can be resistant to because it goes against a narrative that we've had about who we are. So one of the troubles around that, Lisa, that um, I hear from people and I've experienced in myself is how do we know that an emerging value is really linked to the self versus a kind of capricious defense against something that's temporary? And that's really, you know, it's, it's an interesting journey to figure out what's 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 the self talking and what's even a neurotic complex in me that's telling me to get the hell out of dodge absolutely i think that's a great distinction and you know my my quick answer is there's no easy way to know and the word discernment comes up that it's a process of discernment and listening to things slowly over time i mean if someone came into my practice with this hypothetical question. I want to leave political organizing and become a pastry chef. You know, what do, what do I think of that? <laughs> you know, I, I would say, well, you know, we're going to need to kind of circumambulate that and see what, what comes up. One of the things that for myself, it took a long time to discern is one, to know that our, our psyches and our imaginations are incredibly creative. It's not unusual for you to be in a job you even enjoy and to be imagining, you know, 10 other options for your life at any given time, if we're like listening to the imaginal world. So I might notice that, you know, at any given time, there's all kinds of ideas, all kinds of things that I might move forward on. What I finally have figured out for myself is that I need to stay aware of these interesting images to kind of put them in the basket of possibilities. But I've kind of cut a deal with my unconscious. If you want me to act on any of these things, you have to generate enough libido to bring it to fruition. And I have to have a, sen a, a sense of tremendous trust that there's enough energy to carry it forward. And that's, that's often how I will evaluate whether or not something is actionable in my psyche, because it's so miserable to set things in motion and not have enough steam to carry them through. I mean, it's, a, it's such a sense of unnecessary defeat. One way to determine that is uh, by sort of trying it on. So let's take your hypothetical example of becoming a pastry chef. You can interview some pastry chefs. You can shadow somebody who's making pastry. You can look online to see about culinary schools and training. And kind of like shopping for a, a new suit or something, you try it on and activate your imagination of what would this be like if I imagine myself working in this restaurant or doing this kind of thing or standing on my feet all the time. Give it a trial to help in the always difficult process of discernment. Yeah, and you feel you feel bad about yourself. I, I love that, that you just kind of wait to see, really, is there is there energy there? One way that Jung talked about this that, I, that was so liberating for me, because I had found a thread to this earlier in my life, is in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, which is Jung's biography, uh, he was very resistant to letting anybody write a biography for him for a really long time. And finally, I think it was Anila Jaffe who convinced him to kind of enter into this collaboration. And in the book, he says, people had been asking me for years to write a biography, and I had absolutely no libido for it. And then a gradient formed in my psyche so that I could begin the project. And I am at a place in my life, Jung says, where I cannot move forward on something unless a gradient is formed. So by gradient, Jung had this feeling that his psychological world was a landscape and that libido moved like water. So a gradient would mean a kind of slope or a hillside had kind of developed in his psyche. And at the base of the hill was for him uh, the creation of his autobiography and that there was enough water of life flowing down the gradient and accumulating around this idea that he could imagine, you know, engaging the labor to bring it to fruition. And so burnout would feel like the water is all dried up. Yeah, there's no gradient in the psyche, but something external to the psyche is leveraging 
us in some way. I remember <laughs> I remember being at a meeting of our professional association and uh, you know it's a membership organization and so there are there are announcements made when a member leaves the organization and one year we were all there and there was an announcement made that such and such a person had left the society because she didn't find Jungian work interesting anymore or something like that. That was the reason she gave. And I just remember there was like an audible gasp in the room. <laughs> and I, and I th- <laughs> part of my fantasy about why we all gasped. And I think I did too, is like, it is frightening to think that your libido that kind of gets you out of bed every morning and makes you, you know, sort of feel juiced up to do your life could just evaporate. (laughs) But I'm aware that it could. And in that evaporating, that the landscape has become flat so that life force isn't moving gravitationally in a particular direction. And that's one of the experiences of burnout is that everything is, uh, has an equal value, that everything is just a tone of gray. I'm thinking, too, about what a lot of loss there is and how hard that is for us to face. So the thing that meant so much to me, including being a Jungian analyst, (laughs) um, has dried up and the landscape is flat and things are kind of gray. And where am I going next? I don't know. I know what meant a lot to me. I know what was, and I do not know what lies ahead. And that's scary. And and that brings up perhaps another podcast, which is transitions, how we navigate, perceive, how do we know we're in a real transition? That kind of thing happens when people are deciding, let's say, to divorce. Some people establish, again, that kind of flat land in a relationship. And, you know, it has to go on for many, many years before they say, wow, you know, this is just going to remain flat, you know, and, and can I sustain the libido for the sacrifices that are required in a marriage due to no one's fault, just kind of not flowing. I think the question of burnout is is fantastic. And I think that it is part of this modern situation. I think it has to do with our alienation from our instincts so that we don't even have to know how to interpret the language of our instincts. It has to do with allowing corporate voices or advertising voices to become demigods inside of ourselves so that we're actually alienated from the language of the self in terms of leading us forward and to develop the tolerance for not knowing the new map that's going to emerge with all of these meanings. So I don't know whether we've answered a lot of questions, but you know, I think the the issue feels a little more clarified to me. And I think that may give us a a good enough wrap-up to move on to what we've been talking about, the life of the psyche, and a dream from one of our listeners. Hi, this is Deb from This Jungian Life Podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, And now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this thisjungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Uh, today's dream is um, from a teacher, a woman, who is age 32, and here's the dream. I find myself in a dark place, somewhere else, and I am hearing a male voice that I cannot see coming from behind me toward the left side of my body, telling me what to do, and I am obeying submissively, wanting him to know I was docile and serving him completely. I was simply cleaning a coffee machine, 
It seemed like an easy and ordinary task he had asked me to do, and I wanted to show him how well I could do it. Suddenly, what I thought to be a black coffee machine turned out to be a human-sized male mannequin. The voice said, clean him too, clean him well. It had a wig with black, mid-long hair, and it had a disturbing fixed expression on its face like a rictus. It was wearing a black tuxedo with a frilly white shirt underneath. It scared me and disturbed me a bit, but I was completely drawn to the voice and wanted to serve it as I was cleaning with devotion. It was a long, creepy, silent moment. I really didn't like its outfit, and the voice then ordered me to change the mannequin's clothes to something less ceremonial, and I mentally browsed my ex-husband's clothes for casual jeans and a casual shirt for the mannequin that I could grab, but realized that the jeans were too small for him. I realized that the mannequin couldn't fit in, quote, normal, less attention-grabbing clothes. The presence of the mannequin was so creepy that I woke up. So I'm thinking, you know, in perhaps the context of burnout, of what the dream starts out with, of I found myself in a dark place. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking we should just mention the context. She does say that she's looking for another job that she's planning a summer holiday and she's thinking and worrying about money. So I find myself in a dark place. We don't know much about this dreamer's outer life and what that dark place might refer to, but it's somewhere else. And um, also in the dream, she's looking for clothes from her ex-husband. So there, that may be a real world factor that's really alive for her that she's processing. Yeah, so there's been loss of some kind. And I, I think about the poem from, uh, from Dante of, I found myself in a dark wood. So in the dark place, which we might imagine is the unconscious, it's a place where things are less visible, there's less light, uh, it's harder for us to make out, you know, the things that are in the environment. Perhaps because the ego, the dream ego, is in a, an unconscious place, the male voice, a directing voice, an informing voice, constellates in the psyche and begins to provide structure, provide direction. And what's, you know, again, very interesting is how the dream ego orients towards the directive voice. The word that comes to mind is bhakti. You know, in yoga, there are you know, several different schools of yoga, which are, you know, in in a sense, a response to the different kinds of personalities, whether we have a kinetic personality and then we're drawn to Hatha yoga or an intellectual personality, and then we're drawn perhaps to Raja yoga. But bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion, that this capacity and this joy in being devoted and in being pleasing to a larger Uh, ostensibly spiritual authority. And at least in the dream ego, I don't know whether this is what the outer personality, how it behaves, but here in the dream world, you know, she is uh, highly devotional and seems very comfortable in this role. Yes, perhaps. Although I think that's really interesting. Although it, it, there is, you know, creepiness is a dominant uh, kind of tone in the dream. I had I had a slightly different thought about it, Joseph. Let me try this on, and you can tell me what you think. First of all, I noticed that the male voice is coming fr- behind on the left side of the body. So definitely associated with the unconscious, that which is behind us, which we don't see associated with the left side. Those, those would be two characteristics of something that's associated with the unconscious and it's a male voice. So again, in kind of a classical Jungian understanding, we would wonder about animus and she does behave very submissively. She's docile, completely serving and then, of course, she's also in relationship to this other male figure, which is the uh, mannequin. And I guess I was wondering about if this devotion isn't perhaps misplaced. It certainly makes me curious about this dreamer's relationship to 
the masculine. Perhaps there's, I, w- I would be curious about what her relationship was like with the ex-husband, maybe what her relationship was like with her father, because that would, that usually informs our, our inner masculine. I was wondering, you know, it's, Jung was pretty clear that it's important to have a confrontation with the unconscious, to be curious about it, to orient to it, to want to see what's there, but not to surrender your conscious stance. So I'm thinking about the dream that he had where he's in a dark storm and he's carrying a little candle and he's carefully shielding it from the wind. And he said, you know, that light was my consciousness. And he was very aware that our consciousness you know, can be extinguished by the unconscious, not something that in most people in a kind of modern environment think a lot about, uh, because we tend to be often, you know, very much stuck in an ego place. You know, we can be swallowed up by the unconscious. That's, that's a kind of Jungian uh, kind of formulation for what happens when someone experiences psychosis. I just wonder about the dreamer's attitude toward the unconscious and if it isn't a little bit one-sided in itself that it's too slavishly docile and surrendering of the ego stance. I agree with you, Lisa. Um, Those would be issues that I would want to bring up also and uh, that this is a negative, uh, the masculine, the animus is presented in pretty much predominantly a negative light. So something is arising in the streamer's psyche that says, here's a relationship, here's a little image with a lot of feeling in it of your attitude. That's a snapshot, your attitude toward your own inner masculine and uh, the tendency to obey, to be devoted and to surrender sort of a sense of self, of, of clean him well. And this mannequin uh, has an expression on its face like a rictus, which is a sort of a face, a fixed sort of smile that we know immediately is not not genuine and has not come from a gentle or a joyful place. It seems to be a pretty large mannequin. It's wearing, you know, sort of this black tuxedo with a frilly shirt, so this ultra formal kind of attire. And then when she looks for other clothes. Uh, None of her ex-husband's clothes will fit. This seems to be a very large mannequin. And he can't fit in normal or less attention-getting clothes. So here is something really sort of looming in the psyche. And yet it, it scares her enough. It's so creepy that she wakes up. It's like, whoa, this is attention getting. In terms of the creepy factor, you know, that doesn't really come in until she is trying to fit her husband's clothes on the mannequin, that that's the point in the dream with the introduction of the association to the ex-husband, that prior to that, her adoration for the male voice uh, carries her beyond what, what might have been a certain resistance to engaging it. So the first thing I want to say, though, is I want to say that there is a feminist lens that's kind of rising out of the interpretation, which I think has to be owned a little bit, that it rubs, it can rub women the wrong way to think uh, of a woman being, you know, submissively obedient to a man. The trouble with that for me is that that's a seductive kind of literalism in the dream, that she is the male voice, and she is the ego, and she is the mannequin, and she is the dark environment. And these are all elements of her nature the issue of the feminine identified ego and the masculine identified voice, I think putting a, a feminist political lens on that is is troubling. That's not what I'm saying at all, though. I'm not talking about her being submissive to a male. I'm talking about the ego being submissive to the unconscious, which I think is inappropriate. We shouldn't be uncritically obsequious to the voice of the unconscious. Jung was very clear about that. And I, I also, Joseph, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it's not true that it doesn't get creepy until, I mean, she doesn't use the word creepy until later down, but, you know, the, the reference to rictus, which is, she says it's disturbing, a disturbing expression, and it disturbed her. 
So, and then it, there was a long, creepy, silent moment. And, and so I think it has a dark, troubling feeling around it right from the beginning. I mean, I can see that. We could imagine, you know, this is kind of a Dracula moment and Mina is being, you know, drawn into whatever Dracula wants her to do. So that's one possibility in the dream. Another possibility is that the submission to an unconscious dynamic is a compensation for an outer life where the ego is actually very averse to listening to the unconscious or following the flow of the unconscious. That if I take a more of a classic analysis position, that dreams compensate for conscious attitudes and they give us a different experience of ourselves, I might imagine that this is a person, a female ego, a person who actually isn't servile very much at all, and that she might even be averse to taking advice and might actually have a kind of absolute rejection of following along. And so for her to have a dream experience of enjoying following along, being joined with the direction of of another part of her psyche, could be kind of a radically and disturbing experience of herself. Right. It might, the disturbing creepiness might come from the dream ego feeling nervous about what it would be like to be so open to unconscious direction. Yes. And that if we just look at this particular dream, the dream ego is not being asked to do anything nefarious. It's actually being asked to clean. And from the standpoint of alchemy, there's a couple of things. One, the mannequin could be compared to the alchemical homunculus. And the idea of needing to clean stuff up in the psychic environment, you know, that's a really ancient idea. The the purification of the psychic environment requires a kind of scrubbing. I'm also back on your point very early in our discussion about bhakti yoga and the surrender uh, involved in that of the people are devoted. They bring offerings to uh, a little statue or other image of the God. They circumambulate. They do all the, of these things. And that there, there is a longing in us and in this dream to surrender. And the fear that surrender can lead to domination or some kind of harsh betrayal Mm-hmm. of this male mannequin who looks creepy. Uh, is it safe to surrender? Is it safe to be devoted? Is it safe to love? You know, on that note, I want to say an overarching experience that I'm having with this dream is it, it feels um, like there's a real lack of relationality in it. There's just this disembodied voice. There's no one else present in the dream. The first thing she's cleaning is a coffee machine. So it's something mechanical that then kind of morphs into this mannequin, you know, sort of lifeless thing. So there isn't a sense of, uh, it, it feels sort of there's a profound kind of coloring of isolation to it. And, and even, you know, the thing about dressing the mannequin in, in kind of normal clothes, it would slightly humanize it, right? but it she's not able to do that it doesn't it doesn't fit so there's something that feels a little kind of split off here too i can see that there's a struggle to create a relationship to both the voice and whatever the mannequin represents and that it's uncomfortable and it's mysterious if i think of the mannequin as being a representation of the masculine inside of herself and that the ego is being confronted that her experience or her inner representation of the masculine is like a hollow mannequin that she just dresses up and she used to dress it up in the garb of her ex-husband and it comes to her dressed up in some historical costume before but she's actually just dressing up something that isn't alive inside of her although the male voice is alive somewhere else there is also a confrontation that her relation to the to the masculine is is being worked on, or is at least being brought up in the dream for examination. And maybe her husband felt like a mannequin to her, 
which is pretty hard to tolerate. Yeah, she does say uh, in some of the context for the dream, she says the mannequin looked like a disturbing kind of gloomy male figure that has made its appearance in other dreams throughout my life but I didn't identify him as such in the dream. And she says, as I am thinking and writing about this dream now, I feel scared of it. So I think, Joseph, you know, that's sort of to your point that there is a relationship here with an inner masculine, which is being worked on. But my, I strongly suspect that there's a real wound there. Sure. Because if her relationship to the masculine was, uh, was encouraging in early childhood, she may already have animated, living images inside of her. You know, we could compare this to Pinocchio in a sense, this kind of inanimate masculine and what will it take to come to life and the nervousness of what will it be when it comes to life? Will it be creepy? Will I be dominated by it? Is this going to be really disturbing to me? And there's a lot of unknowns. We could also even compare this to kind of Frankenstein, you know, these inanimate parts are being, you know, stuck together and then dressed you know, and the lightning hasn't animated it yet, you know, there is this question about, you know, what's going to go on with this mannequin, or is it simply going to be, you know, displayed in positions, in which case then the clothing or how it's costumed. But I'd be curious for her to go into active imagination and and see where this the fantasy would move forward for her. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking is that this dream and other dreams have presented her with a recurring kind of image and feeling tone around the masculine. So how how to accept the invitation from Psyche to get closer to what is going on here? What's going on for me, in me, from some other part of me? Maybe even go out and buy not a life-size mannequin, but some kind of a physical image that she can have to help her connect from an external image to her internal world to journal, to write, to engage in active imagination. But something in the psyche is trying to get her attention. And uh, it's a kind of corollary to that the mannequin can't fit in less attention-grabbing clothes. So how to bring this mannequin into life inside her? Uh, I think there's another exploration for her to think about is what is her conscious understanding of you know, domination and submission and power dynamics. And the unconscious is also kind of ringing a bell to say, you know, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about um, the way you might secretly find submission to be very pleasurable and even narcoticizing uh, or not? But, you know, the power dynamic is so explicit in the dream that it begs, you know, a wonderful, rich conversation about, you know, how, how do you nav- navigate power dynamics in your life and in the world? I think that submission is one thing. And it's a, a maybe an attempt in the psyche to get to a place of genuine surrender, which has a spiritual component. The surrender to something more, something deeper, which Jung calls the self. It could be uh, a spiritual awakening of some kind. And that submission is often a a somewhat failed attempt at reaching something spiritually deeper that we can surrender to. Yes, that's exactly right. Your comment evokes this image of the Magdalene drying Jesus' feet with her hair. But at that moment, she apparently was so clear of what Jesus was to her and her relationship to the Christ uh, principle that you know, becoming submissive and docile and and in this display of submission, uh, that there's an archetypal mythology in all of that. And again, in that bhakti way, you know, is she longing to find the right um, icon, the right image, the right uh, point to surrender to? Yeah, I, I think you're you're probably right on about that. I think that she's searching for something. The mannequin feels like a perversion of the principle to which we might surrender. So she's not there yet. But the fact that it's turning up in dream series and asking for a change of clothes certainly seems like something's in progress. Yes, and that she's able to differentiate that the voice, the living voice 
is appealing, but the shell of the mannequin is not. So there's already a differentiation there of not wanting to be entranced by the, sh the shells of the masculine, but she might be entranced by the living masculine in her, which is hopeful, even though the imagery is disturbing. Yes. And that feels like a good place to stop for this week. It does. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.